Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.21, The Great Migration in New England. Last time, we spent our time discussing the Great Migration in England. We dove into why nearly 80,000 people decided that the 1630s were a good time to pack up and get out of town. This week, we are going to return to New England and start looking at those early years in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Massachusetts Bay Colony is going to be one of the major beneficiaries of the Great Migration and would almost overnight grow to become the predominant colony in New England. Back in North America, all these new immigrants are going to need a place to set up shop. New England was already a friendly place for Puritans. Plymouth, after all, had been around for several years now and seemed to be doing okay. However, Plymouth isn't going to be the eventual landing spot. Instead, what will emerge is a new company that will work on settling the rest of the region. In the years after the charter was granted to found Plymouth, several other companies decided to jump into the colonial game. One such company was the Dorchester Group. The Dorchester Group had briefly tried their hands at setting up an area near Cape Ann. If you're looking at a map, Cape Ann is the far eastern outcropping of Massachusetts that juts out into the Atlantic. The plan by the Dorchester Company was to establish a permanent colony in order to exploit the highly fertile fishing grounds off the Cape. The colony itself was a failure, largely because the fishermen really were not ideal colonists. The colony quickly faltered and disbanded in 1626. Those remaining ended up resettling to nearby Salem. While the colony set up by the Dorchester Company would quickly fall flat, one of the investors in that company felt that there was still enormous potential in the region. This man was the Puritan Reverend John White. Born in England in 1575, White had much in common with the pilgrims down in Plymouth. Like the pilgrims, White envisioned a settlement that was based on religious enrichment instead of economic enrichment. When White discovered that there were other groups scattered around England that had similar views to him, he moved towards trying to resurrect the old Dorchester group. However, by 1628, the Dorchester group was all but dead on arrival, and White's plan of saving the old group looked pretty much impossible. Instead, a new group emerged out of the ashes of that Dorchester group, and on March 4, 1629, the Massachusetts Bay Company was founded. A joint stock company, the Massachusetts Bay Company was set up to operate in a similar fashion to the Virginia Company. The new land grant gave the Massachusetts Bay Company control of the lands from the Merrimack River out to Massachusetts Bay. The colony was going to have a governor as well as a council of 18 assistants. The members would all be elected yearly by the free citizens of the colony. Much as in Virginia, the group would have the ability to pass laws and statutes as long as they fell in line with the laws back in England. Interestingly enough, Charles I was pretty quick at granting the charter for the group. This does seem somewhat surprising considering that Charles was at this point busy convincing Puritans in England that he was actually a closeted Catholic. Plus, it isn't like the Virginia Company had been a rousing financial success. I mean, the entire thing had been basically hemorrhaging money from the beginning when they weren't stuck in the middle of conflict with the Indians. More realistically, it does not appear that Charles I was terribly worried that the Massachusetts Bay Company was going to turn into another uber-religious community like what had evolved up in Plymouth. After all, the names on the charter were people that Charles knew, and all of them were trustworthy men in his opinion. And in the defense of Charles, he probably wasn't wrong about these men. Sure, religion was a component of the company, but at the same time, don't doubt that these men didn't want to make a profit. Of course they did. Charles was likely focused on the potential financial gain and was far less aware of settlers like John White, who was interested more in establishing a Puritan haven than he was about turning a profit. Right as things were coming together for the new Massachusetts Bay Company, Charles I entered into his period of personal rule, kicking off the Great Migration. And while men like John White never would actually step foot in Massachusetts, his vision doesn't go unrealized. Among those who were watching events back in England and had become increasingly worried about the king's action was a justice of the peace from Suffolk County named John Winthrop. Winthrop is going to be a huge figure, so big in fact that our next episode is going to literally be all about him. So if you're wondering why I'm not giving Winthrop much of an introduction, it's because he's going to get his very own episode here in two weeks. Now, there is some evidence that Winthrop had a degree of financial incentive in the decision to immigrate, though this does seem to be thin at best. More likely, Winthrop was a Puritan who believed that God's wrath was going to come crashing down on the citizens of England at any moment. 
Winthrop, along with so many of the other 80,000 soon-to-be immigrants, likely watched with a mixture of confusion and horror as Charles I continued to act like somebody who wanted to reintroduce Catholicism. Winthrop, like others, could see the clear writing on the wall and was at a minimum open to a plan to escape from the quickly deteriorating conditions for Puritans back at home. Conveniently, in 1629, an oversight in the drafting of the charter for the new colony proved to be a huge boom for Winthrop and his associates. As it turns out, in the charter, there was nothing that stated that the headquarters of the Massachusetts Bay Company needed to remain in London. This means that the colonists were going to have a great deal of latitude over those able to invest in the company, as they could instead locate it along with them in Massachusetts. Unlike in Jamestown and Plymouth, where the colony is largely managed and run from a bunch of guys not actually on the ground in those places, Massachusetts is going to have no such problem. Its headquarters is going to be nicely placed right in the middle of it all. An agreement was quickly reached with those investors who were not Puritans, and they were bought out of the company on August 26, 1629. On April 8, 1630, Winthrop left along with 11 other ships and about 700 settlers for Massachusetts. The plan was to link up with John Indicott, who had left back in 1628 to go get set up in the old Dorchester settlement in Salem and get a new settlement up and running nearby. The problem was, however, that Salem was never intended to be a permanent outpost. The plan was that when Indicott arrived, he would go to Salem, which makes sense. There had been something of a colony there previously, so hey, it makes sense to use what was already there. However, upon arrival of Winthrop and the new 700 colonists, they found that Salem was in terrible shape. Arriving on June 11th, 1630, what Winthrop and fellow settlers found was that sickness and death was everywhere in Salem. According to Thomas Dudley, one of the most important colonists and a future governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, at least 80 had died since arriving and many more were sick. Winthrop took note that the indentured servants in Salem were upset over their conditions. One of the conditions of the servitude is that they would be provided for as they worked off their period of indenture. However, they were starving too, just like everybody else was. Winthrop went ahead and agreed that because the contracts had been breached, they were all immediately freed. While this meant freedom for the individuals, it also meant that for Winthrop there were now additional hands available that would be able to aid the community at large rather than an individual colonist. Indicott was still in Salem when the mass of settlers arrived. However, he had followed his orders and slowly began constructing a new colony to the south. Located along the Charles River, next to Massachusetts Bay, this particular colony earned the name Charlestown. It seemed that shortly after arriving, or possibly before, scurvy had become a serious problem for the young colony. Between this and the lack of clean water supply, we know that somewhere on the order of 200 of the 700 colonists who had left in April were dead by December. Around September of 1630, the decision was made to relocate from Charlestown to the other side of the Charles River. Fresh water seemed to be easier to come by on the other side of the river, which at the moment was a pretty huge draw. Once relocating, Winthrop, along with some 150 other settlers, named their new settlement after the town in Lincolnshire where many of them were from. With that, Boston was born. If you're curious about Charlestown, it does continue to exist today and eventually is going to become a neighborhood of Boston. Looking ahead just a little bit, we are going to return to Charlestown in the future. Charlestown is going to become a critical place during the American Revolution, as that is where Bunker Hill is located. Unfortunately, virtually all of the original settlement in Charlestown was destroyed during the American Revolution by the British troops. However, that is all a story for our future, but for now know that Charlestown still does exist as a neighborhood in modern Boston. When talking about the early colonial experience, the most common thread is the incredibly high risk of death. As we have seen, becoming a colonist isn't something to do if you're hoping to live a long life. Frankly, it's not really a great idea if you're hoping to survive just another year. Both in Jameson and then again in Plymouth, we spent a huge amount of time talking about the high death rates. Yet, in the subject of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, there is hardly a whisper of it. Searching around, I can hardly find anything about those settlers in Salem, other than the death rate was high. What high means is going to have to be left open for interpretation, unless somebody listening has actual numbers. What we do know is that from 1630 to 1631, I consistently did find the number with the death rate hanging out between two and 300 colonists. So, for the sake of easy math, we are looking at a death rate through the first year after the Winthrop fleet of between 25 and 40%. 
We know from William Bradford that over the first winter in Plymouth, about half the company died. In Jamestown, the first year saw about three quarters of the colony die. That's not even including the starving time, which would kill off another 75% of the colony several years after that initial landing. This brings up an obvious question then. Was Massachusetts that much safer of a place than either Jamestown or just down the road in Plymouth? The answer is probably not. I think the key differences here are simply a numbers game. The Winthrop fleet brought along 700 people, so even if we kill off 300 of them, we are still left with a population of 400. The greater numbers act in many ways to mask the hardships that they actually faced. All of this is also going on under the backdrop of the Great Migration. People are going to be flooding into the Massachusetts Bay Colony throughout the decade. The population of Massachusetts is going to soar. Because of this, we don't really see the struggles quite as clearly illustrated as we do in the colonies that experience lower population growth. All of this is to say that, yes, the first year in Massachusetts was, by all objective measures, probably pretty miserable. However, it is not so brutal that it is going to factor in as a major part of the story. Of major importance during that first year, other than, you know, not dying, was the establishment of government as well as the foundation of the church. Winthrop quickly emerged as an early leader of the colony. Back in London, he had been influential as a lawyer and had sat on the Suffolk Commission. Winthrop wasn't looking to really do anything drastic here and mostly wanted to emulate the local administration from England. The charter that Winthrop and company brought over to New England gave them virtually unlimited power. Under the terms of that charter, a group of assistants was required to meet just once a month and an additional four times a year as a general court. Anything beyond that was permissible, however, it shows just how wide-ranging the power of the government was. What was selected was a form of government whereby the group of assistants would be chosen by the freemen of the colony. Then the assistants would choose the governor and the deputy governor. Specifically, the charter stated that, that from henceforth forever there shall be one governor, one deputy governor, and 18 assistants of the same company, to be from time to time constituted, elected, and chosen out of the freemen of said company. The big takeaway out of this is that the charter stipulated that there be elections from among the freemen of the colony. However, the bigger fact is that the charter was not exactly filled with much in the way of direct instructions. For instance, sure we know that there were going to be elections for the assistants, however the information is much more scarce when it comes to the actual mechanism in place for those elections. The charter says that the leadership is going to be chosen from amongst the freemen, However, it fails to define what constitutes a freeman or whom is doing the electing. The charter would further stipulate that four times a year, the freemen of the colony would meet in the general court, admit new freemen, and select those government positions. Those elected to the general court to an assistant would then meet monthly for the practical governance of the colony. During that first meeting of the general court, as per the charter in October 1630, it was decided that the original charter should be modified. This modification changed it to where the freemen of the colony were only voting for the assistants and that it fell to the assistants and the assistants alone to select who was going to sit as the governor and the deputy governor. At the same time, the general court decided that the power to make laws should rest not with the greater court, but rather in the hands of the governor. This means that the general court, which is made up of all the freemen in the colony, originally was the group that was supposed to make the laws. However, With the changes made at that first general meeting in Massachusetts, it was modified to be where the governor alone held all of the power to make the laws of the colony. This represents a massive increase in the power of the colonial government. So why on earth did the general court agree to subvert so much of its own power into the hands of so few? The easy answer appears to be that almost nobody showed up to that first meeting. Those making the rules for how it would function during that first meeting, that small group that showed up, would end up being the guys who held all of the power. In that regard, it was easy to subvert their own power. What they basically did was they took the power of the general court and handed it right back to themselves in a different capacity. Though that general court made up of the freemen still did have the power to elect the assistants, during that first meeting it was also clarified exactly what a freeman was, and this is going to have a profound impact on the future of the colony. A freeman is now defined as somebody who is free, so not a slave or an indentured servant. Which, okay, yeah, that makes sense. A freeman must be free. More importantly, however, a rule was put in place stipulating that the freeman must also be a member of the church if they were to have a vote or have any kind of say in government. This is a very key provision. 
This provision means that the power is going to flow through a base of voters that are going to remain loyal to the Puritan values. With the free men seeing so much of their power cut during that first general meeting, the question remains then, why leave them any vote at all? Why not just take all of their power and set up some kind of permanent system of assistants who would then always be selecting the governor and the deputy governor? Basically, why not just centralize power so completely that nobody could ever have any kind of a say-so in it? In other words, why extend suffrage to the freemen of the colony at all? To some extent, I think you need to look at this pragmatically. Had the freemen lost all their suffrage, they had not been allowed to vote anymore whatsoever, and this had become a completely centralized system, I think that might actually be enough that back home in England, they'd balk at the entire idea and ask, what are you doing over there? So pragmatically, yes, it is important to let the freemen remain voting members of society. Beyond that, however, the sources are somewhat split as to why the freemen had a vote at all at this point. One view following the revolution is that the freemen of the colony had the vote as an early form of republican ideals within the colonies. In other words, Massachusetts, being the bastion of liberty that it would become during the 1700s, saw those ideals begin right away on the ground in the 1630s with its founding. Now, we know that this probably does not hold a lot of water considering the freemen had just seen their rights cut significantly. This view is a bit revisionist in nature, as they are trying to make early Massachusetts into much more of a democratic society than it actually was. As we've seen, there is actually a centralization of power going on, not an expansion of the voting base. More recently, however, the thinking has gone in the direction that Winthrop and company felt that there was a critical mission in having a covenant with the people. The belief amongst the Puritans was that there was an inherent covenant between God and the people that there was a second covenant between the people and their leadership. In other words, the Puritans believed that people had the right to select the government which they were under. And before you start to think that Winthrop was some early supporter of democratic governments, that's not really true. In fact, Winthrop showed very little interest personally in the idea of democracy, and that's a topic we're going to talk more about in our next episode. What ends up emerging in Massachusetts is an exceptionally top-heavy government. Sure, the freemen could vote for their colonial leaders. However, that is where their political power ended. Once in power, the colonial governor had nearly unlimited power. So you should think of this more as being akin to despotism through popular consent rather than being something more akin to republicanism. This is further supported in future years, as we will see, when Winthrop seems to bristle against any attempts to increase political power outside the hands of the governor. Beyond the pragmatism of allowing the freemen to maintain a vote, to avoid the ire of England, and the covenant that the Puritans felt with the people, there were obvious practical considerations as well here. Winthrop and company clearly wanted to consolidate power, hence why we see the freemen of the colony no longer in a position to pass the laws. However, regardless of how centralized the top-heavy colony had become, the first group of settlers was never going to be able to take and maintain complete control over the colony. From a practical standpoint, it would have made the colonial rule nearly impossible for the company. Nobody is going to want to move from what they feared to be increasing tyranny in England to a situation in New England that wasn't much better. There has been a lot of academic debate over the years on the subject of the early forms of Massachusetts government, with several other arguments about why things ended up the way they did. The next question becomes, why did the general court choose to limit the freemen to being members of the approved Puritan church? After all, I had just talked a few moments ago about the belief in the Puritans that the people being ruled had an implied covenant with the ruling class. So why not simply define freemen more broadly just to include all the free men of the colony? The argument that really seemed to resonate the most with me is that by expanding suffrage to the freemen who are church members, it is a way that the Puritans could maintain control over the future of the colony. By locking voting rights into an approved church, it acts as a safeguard that their way of life will survive. Everybody who has a vote is going to fall, for the most part, in line with those religious beliefs that the Puritans held so dear. It was a low-risk move for the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They controlled membership to the church, which ultimately means that they would still control those who could become freemen with voting rights. Those being extended the right to vote are now pacified that they have a voice in the colonial administration, while the leaders of the colony risk virtually nothing as those being given the rights to vote are likely going to be predictable votes as they would fall in line with church protocol. 
Put simply, we are going to extend the vote to a group of people who think and act just like us and are going to vote just like us. For the freemen, they are still going to have a say in government, though limited. However, that basic fact that they are voting for their own assistance means that the freemen should hopefully be pacified enough that they don't do anything crazy like go and form an angry mob because, hey, they're not being ignored. They are, in fact, being represented. They still maintain a vote. Beyond that, however, by requiring church membership for the freemen, it means that they are going to always vote in line with the established church. It is a method whereby the leadership has protected itself from outside influence while giving the freemen the appearance of having a choice. For the colonial leadership, this is a win-win situation. You have pacified the freemen by not totally centralizing and removing their vote, but at the same time, they have set things up in such a way that the people who do have the vote are always going to vote predictably. They are making a large portion of society happy by ensuring that voting rights are protected, However, they're doing it in such a way that it is unlikely to ever challenge the existing hegemony in the colony. By modern standards, nothing looks very democratic about any of this. However, in the years to come, as we will discuss as we move on here, the centralization that we have seen today is going to end up giving way as the population of the colony swells and pressure mounts to give the freemen more control. The freemen, despite being very limited in their voting base, still did have at least some rights in voting for the people who would represent them. In that way, an argument could be made that this is still a step in the right direction towards a more democratic system, though admittedly, this is more of a baby step than any kind of real leap. We are going to spend much of the rest of the season looking at New England as democracy does in fact begin to trickle in more and more over the coming decades. Political systems aside, I want to spend the rest of today looking at life in the early colony. Throughout the 1630s, there remained a steady and constant flood of new settlers into Massachusetts. In 1632, the population of the colony was right around 2,000. By the time we get to 1637, the population was up around 8,000. This stands in stark contrast to what we have seen in the other colonies. For example, if you look back at Jamestown in 1622, before the massacre, the population was somewhere in the ballpark of just 1,400 people and that is 15 full years after the settlement was launched. Massachusetts had a population of around 8,000, less than a decade after its founding. Towns began to spread up throughout New England, all of which followed a similar model. At the center of every community stood the pillar of the community, the church. The church, as we have discussed today, served not only as a place to find salvation, but it was a gateway into the political apparatus of state. If you wanted to be involved in the politics of New England, you had to become a member of the church. Becoming a member of the church appeared to include an interview process where you would essentially be getting vetted to make sure that you were not walking in with ideas that were antithetical to the prevailing beliefs. Land became the next critical aspect of the community and one that is going to have a huge impact on the future of the region. Land was distributed equally into long strips that made sure that everybody had an equal distribution of woodlands, meadowlands, and land for pasture. The key to note here is that these are not big plots of land. They are basically big enough for a house, a personal area at a farm, and a space to raise livestock. The community would hold some land communally, however in New England there was a push towards the individual farm rather than having a system of communal farming. The settlers in Plymouth could, of course, tell their new neighbors just how more efficient the small personal farms were in providing food than a system made up of large communal farms. Remember that it was the switch from communal to personal farming in Plymouth that had ended the food shortages that occurred earlier in the history of that colony. It's also important to note that unlike in Jamestown, there is not a move to arbitrarily increase the amount of land being controlled by England. If you recall, one of the big factors in the massacre of 1622 was how spread out the plantations were. In New England, you end up with settlers having smaller plots of land that are all kept relatively close together. This is beneficial for defensive reasons because nobody wanted to get spread out too thinly like occurred in Jamestown. Beyond that, however, it would end up being a contributing factor to the long-term economic development of the region. Whereas Virginia would become known for its huge landholding plantations, New England would remain relatively dominated by towns of smaller personal farms and a thriving base of artisans. Relations with the local Indians were not as dicey and convoluted as we see in Jamestown or Plymouth. This can probably be attributed to the fact that this isn't the first time that either the English nor the Indians were dealing with one another. After all, we aren't that far away from Plymouth. 
The Indians by this point would have been dealing with the English for a few years and would have at least a passing knowledge of their customs. Likewise, the settlers in Plymouth would have been able to share the collective knowledge with the new colonists. It also doesn't hurt that with so many English coming over so quickly, it would have served to minimize one of the greatest advantages that the Indians held, that numerical advantage. If we said that Jamestown represented a conveyor belt of settlers who just kept coming, the Great Migration is more like a fire hose. Settlers kept pouring into the colony at an absolutely outstanding rate. For the first time in English North America, the English population would be seen as an advantage and not a liability. Tensions would arise when the Puritans near Boston decided that the Indians should also be subject to the English legal system. This, of course, caused problems because it's not like the Indians had any clue what the laws that they were now being accused of breaking even were. Despite that, however, the Indians did seem to figure it out pretty quickly and were not themselves afraid to use the system to their own benefit. And in all fairness, the Puritans would prosecute crimes committed against the Indians. In one example from 1632, an Indian complained that an English settler had stolen some corn from him. Sure enough, the settler was convicted, fined, and his men whipped. Well, things remained relatively peaceful for the first few years. By 1636, we are going to see a major conflict break out between the English and the Pequot tribe. In an event known as the Pequot War, we are going to see the largest explosion of hostilities between the English settlers in New England and the local Indian population to date. That, however, is still down the road for us. What can we take away from today? The establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony is going to be a transformative event, not just for the region, but for the future of the United States. One of the things that I didn't really mention today, but I think is critical, is that this development is all going on without any meaningful involvement from the English back in England. The colonial headquarters was based out of Massachusetts. Back in England, they had almost no real control over their subjects who would cross the Atlantic. In Plymouth and Jamestown, the center of power remained in England, meaning that the home islands still maintained control. This is a huge factor in what is eventually going to become the Massachusetts sense of independence. While men like Winthrop and Thomas Dudley all would have still considered themselves to be loyal English subjects, they are certainly not complaining that there was so little involvement from the government back home. As we are going to discuss next time, Winthrop was personally involved in helping ensure that the headquarters for the company would in fact be based out of Massachusetts, as well as being involved in the process of purging out everybody who didn't fall properly in line with the Puritan belief system. In the episodes to come, we are going to begin seeing more and more political development throughout New England. And while I have spent much of the day telling you today that we need to be cautious about referring to the Massachusetts Bay Colony as being democratic, this is an important step. It's not there yet. However, the table is absolutely being set for later actions that are going to expand the electorate and move the colony in a decidedly more democratic direction. We are going to start seeing those changes occur pretty quickly, and we're going to talk about them in the upcoming episodes. With the Massachusetts Bay Colony now on the ground and functioning, I'm going to take the opportunity to take a break from our narrative and jump into a pair of special episodes. I'm going to explain more next time on how these episodes are going to work, but what I want to do from time to time is look at some of the more influential people who helped make the United States what it is today. Basically, those men who managed to leave their fingerprint on the body politic of the United States. The next two episodes are going to focus on two men who did just that. I'm talking, of course, about John Winthrop, and then the week after, Roger Williams. After that, we will return to the narrative and get back to the developments within the Massachusetts Bay Company. Until then, I hope you all have a fantastic two weeks, and thank you for listening. 